Hey everyone. So the day where you're starting your chapter seven notes, this begins a new unit or unit three. You should have received your unit three vocabulary yesterday. Um, so we're gonna be looking at in this unit, the dominant powers in Europe and Asia going from 1450 to 1750. So we're starting off with chapter seven with the age of European exploration that went from 1450 to 1600. This was a time where it made a huge impact on the world. There was a lots of things that came into place to be able to spread civilization throughout the world. All right, so first we're gonna look at the Native American civilizations because before the Europeans began exploring in the Americas, there was already native populations. So this is in North America, in the United States specifically now, there were different regions of the Indians. There was the Iroquois Confederacy, five civilized tribes, the Plain Indians and the Pueblos. And we're gonna look at each one of those. First, we're gonna look at the Pueblos. The Pueblos was the name for the Indians that lived in the Southwest region of North America. Pueblo means towns. They lived in small villages composed of several family groups or clans. This is an example of a Pueblo built village. They made their homes out of adobe, which is a mixture of dr a dry clay, it's a mixture of sand and straw to make this dried clay. Some of them actually built their homes by carving into the sides of rocks and to the sides of cliffs. They were often called cliff dwellers for that reason. Now looking at the Plains Indians, the, Pl the Pueblos were stationary. They stayed where they're at. The Plains on the other hand were nomadic, meaning they migrated around the grasslands in search of food. They lived in teepees because teepees were easily able to be taken down and put back up. The groups that made up the Plains Indians were the Sioux, Cheyenne, Crow, Blackfeet, and the Comanche. They had no single religion. They practiced most of all animism. We've talked about this before. This is belief in that all things possess spirits. All right, and then looking at the Indians in the eastern portion of the United States, these would be the Indians that lived where we live at now. So you have the mounds builders. These were the Indians who built earthen mounds. The mounds were often used as, they could be used as grave sites, they could be used as temples. Some of them were effigy mounds, meaning they were, um, built in the shape of an animal or an object such as this one here. It kind of looks like an alligator almost. Um, there are other effigy mounds. When we do 4-H, we talk about rock eagle. Rock eagle, the camp is around a effigy mound in the shape of a rock, or in the, excuse me, in the shape of an eagle there. Um, there's others around the Macon area. There's other Indian mounds here in Georgia and throughout the Eastern portion of the United States. The Iroquois Confederacy, they are found more up in the northern part of the eastern, like the New England area, Virginia on up area. They were a group of six tribes who spoke the common language of the Iroquois. Now it was, they were unique in the United States in that most of the tribes did not come together in a big government like this. They weren't like the Mayans and the Incas and the Aztecs that we're gonna be looking at in just a few minutes. They tended to stick to their own groups, but the Iroquois Confederacy did that, did differently. They came together, all spoke the same common language of the Iroquois, and they made up almost a government within itself. They lived in what is today Northern New York. And then in the South where we live at was the five civilized tribes. These were the, um, they maintained peaceful relations with the Europeans and adopted some European ways. Some of the tribes include the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, and the Seminole tribes. And now let's look at Central and South America. And we see these three groups here, the Aztecs, the Mayas, and the Incas. 
your project that I assigned right before I left is over these three civilizations. So you should, if you've already been working on it, you should be familiar with it. So we're gonna look first at the Mayas. They're an Indian civilization in Central America that consisted of many independent city-states. Their capital built around 1345 in Tanicha which is an island in the middle of a lake in Central Mexico. To be able to build the city there, they at first made floating islands from mounds of water plants and put them in the middle of the lake. And once those were rooted, the Aztecs filled the roots with soil and built on them. The Finnish city had many islands that the Aztecs accessed by boats and bridges. Several long causeways connected the islands of Tenochtitlan and to each other and to the mainland. They were accomplished mathematicians and astronomers. They were characterized by war and warriors. Every Aztec man who was able to fight had to serve in the army. They built, they developed calendars, built large temples. They built pyramids similar to the ones in Egypt in the middle of many of their cities. So that was the Mayas. Now looking at the Aztecs. They were also an Indian society. Oh, excuse me, sorry. I was, goodness gracious. Let me back up because I just read all of that about the Aztecs about the Mayans, but it was incorrect. So let me back up here just a minute. All right, so scratch all that. All right, so the Mayans lived in Central America and what includes Guatemala and the Yucatan Peninsula. Unlike the Aztecs and the Incas, the Mayans did not have a strong central government. The height of their culture lasted from 300 to 800 AD. They developed a calendar. They were accomplished mathematicians and astronomers. They built large pyramids similar to the ones in Egypt in the middle of many of their cities. All right, so now looking at the Aztecs, they were the ones that their society was characterized by war and warriors. Every man became a part of the army. Their capital was Tenochtitlan, that was built out in the middle of the lake. And the Quetzalcoatl was their god whom the Aztecs were expecting to return, which was one, they anticipated his return. And this is one of the beliefs that made them open to the deception of the Spanish conquistadors. When the Spanish conquistadors came over, they act, the people, the Aztecs thought these were their god, their god that Quetzalcoatl that they were waiting on. And they played into that to be able to get to their gold and other things. And then they just killed them. Right, now looking at the Incas and in what is modern day Peru. The Incas were an Indian civilization in the Andes mountains of South America. Their capital was Cusco. It built large buildings out of stone with great precision. Without the use of mortar, they constructed buildings with such accuracy that a knife blade cannot fit between the stones. Their religion was polytheistic. They, the ruler remained, excuse me, retained the title of Inca and served as the emperor's living God. And they performed animal sacrifices during four great festivals. All right, so that's the end of our section one, moving on to section two, which today, on, which is Friday for y'all, y'all will be covering sections one and two. So section two is the origins of European exploration. What made them want to explore? And then what helped them to be able to explore? What changed at this time that made it possible for them to finally be able to explore unknown lands? All right. The Italian explorer Marco Polo journeyed to the Far East, which was a land of mystery to the 13th century Europe. And while he was over there, he told these stories that were eventually written down into a book. And these stories, while elaborate, told the tale of what people could find in the Far East. So when he went back and this book was published, people in Europe wanted to go and see this land of gold, silks, and spices. He wanted, they wanted to see the coal that they were burning and said it would. They wanted to see the nice things that were there. 
So people began looking for a way to be able to make it to this mysterious land that Marco Polo told them about. So his descriptions of the vast wealth of China were recounted in a book, the Book of Marvels. Let me see. Up. Uh, let me back up. All right. So this is some of the reasons for exploration and conquest. We had economic, social, political, and religious. Economic. They wanted to look for new trade routes to be able to cut out the middleman and be able to make more profit. So at this time, caravans have been coming across the continent, bringing what goods they could from the Far East. But the Muslims eventually cut off that road or they charged a higher price. So these merchants began to look for a way to be able to cut out that middleman, cut out that road there and find their own way to be able to get these goods. Some people went just for the thrill of adventure. They were curious. They wanted to see all of these things. They also wanted to receive the praise of others. They wanted to get that attaboy, that way to go. You discover something new. And also just going along those same lines, just a quest for glory, to have their name go down in history. Political. To lay claim to foreign lands and be able to establish colonies and be able to have rights to the raw materials that these places produced. And then religious. They want some explorers sailed in search of a mythical king in Africa, Prester John, who was thought to be a Christian. Europeans hoped to get his help to defeat the Muslims and preserve Christianity. So then what changed that it gave them the capability of being able to explore? There was lots of different technology. One is in shipbuilding. The, with the creation of a new ship called the Caravelle. It was a smaller ship that could travel better in open seas, but also sail upriver in the shallow coastal waters. They had three or four masts and used triangular sails combined with one or more square sails. The triangular sails enabled the Caravelle to man maneuver in port and travel swiftly over shallow water. The square sail allowed the ship to walk, catch more wind and travel quickly on the open seas. Ships played a central role in exploration, trade, and defense. Changes in navigation also helped. Maps of the areas that were familiar to Euro Europeans become more and more accurate by the 15th centuries. As more and more people went to these new places, they were able to make more accurate maps that people could follow. And there were three navigational aids used by the Europeans, and they were the trade winds, compass, and the astrolabe. Trade winds were winds that blew from east to west that brought the European explorers across the Atlantic Ocean. These winds blew behind them and were able to blow them across the ocean, and they were able to go further, faster. And as they were able to map out these trade winds, they knew the best time of the year to go. They had the compass, which we've talked about the compass before. It was an instrument that used its lodestone, a magnetic material to find direction. And then the astrolabe. This was used by sailors to measure the angle between the sun or a star and the horizon at a specific time of day or night. From this, the sailor could determine his latitude. And then there were some early seamen navigated by dead reckoning. They decided that they thought their location was, estimated their speed, looked at the map and aimed for a compass heading that they believed would get them to their goal. With the aid of the astrolabe, the sailors were able to improve their accuracy by traveling north or south to get to the desired latitude. Then they would sail east or west on the latitude until they came to land. And with all of this, you also had advancements in naval warfare. New weapons began to be attached to the ships, the cannon. The Venetians were among the first to actually use cannons on board their ships. And it was during this age of exploration that the Europeans began to use it. They used their fleet both to carry on trade and to defend their own ships against piracy. In 1492, the Iberian Peninsula was freed from Muslim control. I, 
the Iberian Peninsula is the peninsula where Portugal and Spain is. Portugal and Spain were bordered by the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. Therefore, they had a long history of shipbuilding and navigating these bodies of water. With access to the Atlantic Ocean, Spain sent explorers west and Portuguese traveler, sailors traveled south to find a new water route to the east. All right, so that is all you're gonna do today. So on Monday, you will do 7.3. And Tuesday, you'll do 7.4, so you can pause the video and pick back up with it on Monday. All right, so now we're gonna move on to 7.3, growth of European exploration. We're going to look specifically at the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the English, and what they did to be able to explore. All right, Portu the Portuguese, had a man named Prince Henry, and he loved everything about sailing and exploring. And he created a school to be able to train sailors to be able to go out and explore the world. He got the name Prince Henry the Navigator because of this. And then there was Bartolomeu Diaz. He was a Portuguese explorer that rounded the tip of Africa without realizing it. He got caught up in a bad storm and his ships rounded the tip of Africa and he didn't know where he was. Once he became aware of where he was, he turned back and saw land. He wanted to continue to explore, but his crew got scared, so they returned back to Portugal. Ten years later, in 1497, the Cape of Good Hope Ooh, excuse me, the first Portuguese ship landed in India. After rounding the Cape of Good Hope, which is the southern tip of Africa, Vasco da Gama and his crew sailed up the east coast of Africa, sought the trading cities where they met both African and Arab traders. Landing on the southwest east coast, southwest coast of India, da Gama and his men were surprised to find an advanced people. And when they got there, they tried to trade their ships full of these Portuguese good cloth, honey, oil, but the Indian people there were not impressed. They had lots better things. It took them 10 years to get all of their stuff sold. And when they came back to Europe, they were able to sell it and be able to ensure, pay for their voyage and be able to pay for 60 more voyages. So their money, they made a lot of return on their investment for their hard work. In the mid 16th century, the Portuguese were among the first Europeans to land in Japan. A few years later, the Jesuit missionary Francis Xavier arrived in Japan and sought to convert the people to Roman Catholicism. All right, now looking at the Spanish, this was actually who Christopher Columbus sailed for. Columbus was actually Italian, but his voyage was financed by Spain. He went to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain and said, I believe I can get to the East by sailing West. Will you finance my trip? So they said, yes, they financed it. So he hoped to be able to discover a shorter route to China and the Indies. So in August, 1492, he set sail on his three ships, the Nina, the Pinta and the Santa Maria. But Columbus never actually made it to India. He instead discovered a new continent. In October, he landed on an island and what he thought were the Indies. So that's why he called the people there Indians because he thought he was in the Indies. But he actually landed in the Caribbean. By 1519, Ferdinand Magellan sailed west from Spain in an effort to sail around the world. His ships rounded the tip of South America and crossed the Pacific Ocean. Tragically, Magellan was killed in the Philippines. The surviving members of his crew continued the voyage and returned to Spain. This journey lasted three years, but it proved that Columbus's theory was correct. It was possible to reach the east by sailing west. When Magellan rounded the tip of South America, he left the Atlantic and entered a new ocean that he named the Pacific from the Latin word for peace.
Now looking at the English, not to be outdone by the Spanish and Portuguese, Queen Elizabeth of England sent Sir Francis Drake to sail around the world in 1577. You'll learn more about Drake when you get into U.S. history, but he was a group, he was one of the group called the Sea Dolls. These were a group of English sea captains who acted almost like pirates on the behalf of Queen Elizabeth to be able to strike at the economic heart of the Spanish. After he sailed around the world, took him three years to do it, he published a report of his voyage. He told of seeing new lands and peoples and enjoying God's gifts and nature. He also described times of hardship on his expedition. For example, wind, storms, heat, and lack of fresh water plagued the voyage. Now looking at the Spanish, the Spanish sent men called conquistadors over to the new world to find gold, conquer the people and convert them to Roman Catholicism. They were often harsh and they just brutally destroyed Indian civilizations in Central and South America in search of gold. All right, Central America, the Hernando Cortez encountered the Aztecs. In 1519, he arrived in the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, which is modern day Mexico City. The Aztec ruler Montezuma greeted Cortez and gladly showed him samples of the Aztec's great wealth. Cortez convinced Montezuma that the King of Spain was the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl and demanded that the Aztecs submit to Cortez as the king's representative. Montezuma submitted to Cortez's demands and urged his people to cooperate. Cortez eventually massacred most of the Aztecs, and as the Aztec people began to realize the Spanish appetite for gold and power knew no bounds, they refused Cortez's, le Cortez's leadership. When Montezuma again urged his people to submit to the Spanish, they stoned him to death. Francisco Pizarro in South America proved to be even more brutal than Cortez. He traveled to the New World to find gold and to use violent methods to seize it at every opportunity. But he was inched, he set himself up as ruler of the Incan Empire, but he was eventually killed by those of his own country. As the Europeans explored other continents, they interacted and sometimes collided with other civilizations. Responses to European exploration vary from one area to another. We're gonna look at a couple of those places such as the Ottoman Empire. While the European ventured out on the seas to explore new lands, the Ottoman Empire continued its expansion. Portugal, the Netherlands, France, and Great Britain established colonies in, the, in India. The Chinese allowed limited trade with Europeans during the early period of European exploration. For a brief period, commerce and cultural exchange occurred between Japan and Europe. By 1639, the Japanese expelled foreigners. Siam stood alone in the Southeast Asia as its ability to resist European efforts to establish colonies on its soil. All right, and that's the end of 7.3. So Demario will pick up 7.4. All right, so with 7.4, this is our last section of notes. It's really short. Tomorrow you will review for your test and then you'll take your test on Wednesday. So today we're looking at the consequences of European exploration. One maybe good thing was the spread of Roman Catholicism and Latin, but yeah, not really a good thing. The Spanish explorers, they wanted to spread Roman Catholicism to the Indians, but they also wanted gold and territory. So the two doesn't kind of go well with each other. People, the Indians weren't going to listen to their religion if they're also killing them and stealing from them. Some did good. One of them, however, most of the work of converting the surviving Indians was left to the Catholic clergy, Catholic clergy. 
In 1502, a Roman Catholic friar named Bartolomeo de las Casas came to the Americas to serve as a missionary to the Indians. Las Casas and others like him spoke out against the cruel treatment of Indians by their fellow Spaniards. Since the Roman church became the protector of the Indians, many did convert to Roman Catholicism. The Indians developed a strong loyalty to the priests and the Catholic church. The Roman church took advantage of this loyalty and brought most of Central and South America under its influence. And then they also introduced plants, animals, and diseases. This was where we start getting to the part that's not really so great. While the Indians already grew tobacco, the English brought tobacco from the West Indies and planted it in America. This variety of tobacco proved to be very profitable and colonists planted large areas with this plant. It brought wealth to the settlers, but it also depleted the soil rapidly. Soon more and more land was needed to maintain production and meet the growing demands. Explorers introduced several animals, including cattle, horses, and pigs to America. Not all of these were bad. Cattle is a good thing, but it's, again, you take in more and more forest land to be able to graze your cattle on. Horses actually were beneficial, especially to the Plains Indians. They were able to take these horses and be able to ride greater distances in search of food. Pigs, again, were not a very good thing because we think may think like domesticated pigs, like the pigs that my daughter shows that I've talked about before. But their pigs they brought were often let loose and they turned into what we see as the wild pigs now, the wild hogs that we see now that we deal with, like on my farm, we have to deal with them all the time because they destroy crops and destroy the ground. So this all came from the Spanish bringing these animals over. And then various human born diseases like smallpox, typhus, measles, Chicken pox, diphtheria, and influenza killed large numbers of Indians. The Indians had never experienced diseases like this before, so they didn't have any kind of immunity built up to them. So when they were exposed to it, it destroyed them. Without realizing, those who survived the plagues that reduced populations in Europe may have brought these diseases to the Indians. Since the Indians had no previous exposure to these diseases, they had not developed immunity to them. And the results of interaction with other cultures. European explorers struggled to understand many of the cultures they encountered in foreign lands. Some were surprised to find complex cultures in India, China, and the Americas. Others were horrified at the sight of human sacrifices among the Aztecs in Central America. Europeans were also appalled by the violent methods of defeating enemies such as beheading and cannibalism. Conquistadors like Cortez and Pizarro slaughtered Indians by the thousand, destroyed whole villages. Spanish forces in general were especially brutal in conquering the Indian civilizations and then enslaving the survivors to labor in the mines and fields. And that's the end of chapter seven. So y'all have a good rest of your day. Tomorrow you need a review. Make sure you write down the quizzes code that you can look at it and study at home. And then your test is on Wednesday. Thanks y'all. Have a good rest of your day.